So first and foremost, let's just dive straight into it, right? Because I know that anyone who is a fan of Black Veil Brides is going to be so excited about the fact that a little bit later on this month, we're getting bleeders. So tell us a bit about this EP. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm tremendously excited about it because the source material that's kind of the initial inspiration for it, um, being the Sweeney Todd, uh, is a thing that as as cultural ip as it's referred to now these these sort of characters that exist out there in the zeitgeist um is something that was really one of the first uh character loves along with batman that i had as a kid so my my dad had the uh 1979 cast recording with uh, len carew and angela lansbury and it was like one of the first things that I learned how to sing to was uh, the original cast recording of, of uh, Sweeney Todd, in particular, the song, My Friend. Mm -hmm. um, and it just became this sort of touchstone character for me. Uh, you know, as a kid, I had, and, you know, still to this day, I, I, I found ways to deal with it. But as a kid, you know, um, I really struggled uh, with my mental health and I was afraid of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And um, scary stuff was this thing that both fascinated me and also terrified me so much that you know I, I I couldn't sleep and I would make like booby traps in my room as a kid because I thought something was going to attack me and oh, um bless. you know I had a lot of I had a lot of uh really really strong fears and you know a lot of that comes from you know it's, it's not that uncommon for people with you know severe ADHD or OCD or these things that you these histrionics and things manifest themselves, particularly when you're young in ways that you can't understand. So you're trying to figure out ways to make, make them make sense. And Sweeney Todd was important because it was something that scared me, but it was something that I enjoyed. So I would kind of, you know, it was almost this thing that elicited a, a big reaction out of me. And what I found was that stuff like Sweeney Todd and um, the resurrection era misfits, like the famous monsters record and things like that, that were horror or scary things that were presented in a more sort of kitschy tongue in cheek way um, were ways to take the fangs off of these things that frightened me a little bit and uh, was an entry point for me to start getting into that kind of stuff. So um, it was always with me, you know, when I was in high school, uh, my friend Chance and I did uh, uh like a sketch uh, show on the early form of youtube um that a lot of our fans have dug up and referenced because i used to play a sweeney todd character in it all the time and it was a big deal it was so much of a big deal that in 07 when the movie came out with johnny depp i was one of those people who was like angry that the movie was made because now the thing that i love was going to become like you know everybody was going to know about i was i was gatekeeping before that was a term <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then I ended up really loving the movie. So, you know, it worked out for me, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a big part of my life and, uh, you know, we can get into more about how that plays into this, but from a, just the, the beginning stages of me as a guy wearing makeup and singing songs in a baritone voice, uh, it was, it was a big, big part of that. And I love that. Cause I think what you're talking about here, that fascination, a lot of people will identify with that. Mm. And I think a lot of young rock and alternative people have that very similar experience. Are you still into the horror side of things now? Or how has that evolved? Yeah, now I actually, you know, as I got older, I started getting into, you know, all the slasher movies and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's always through the prism of the, I, I, you know, I love comic books. So I like mm. the uh, the art of it and the costumes and, and that kind of stuff. You know, when I was young, I got to meet, um, you know, people like Paul French and Wayne Toth and these guys who do uh, special effects makeup. And so then that became something, you know, my mom um, did makeup for a company called Elizabeth Arden when I was a little, little like, kid as a baby. So that was where it started for me of like playing with makeup and making myself look like a monster and all that kind of stuff. So it was through my whole life. And so I got interested in horror movies because there's so much uh, artistry involved. It's such a it's such a kind of a cousin, so to speak, to the comic book world. And in a lot of cases, you know, with stuff that I loved as a kid, like uh, Dark Man and The Phantom, and uh, obviously Batman, especially the Tim Burton Batman movies, there is yeah. horror or mm. scary elements to those things. So it was kind of part and parcel together. And um, you know, all of that is what I took into 
the early stages of the band and, and kind of creating these character makeups and um, the costume side of it. And, you know, we, it's always been about making stuff out of nothing, you know, particularly when we started, we had no money. So the early stage clothes that people see in like, you know, the early 2010s Kerrang covers and stuff of us were, were wearing literally Walmart, Miley Cyrus brand uh, jeans and leggings. And we would, stud everything ourselves and you know we would go there was a place in north hollywood that sold like leather goods and studs and we would buy bags and bags of studs and sit in my first apartment this little one bedroom apartment in east hollywood and with our teeth stud for hours and hours and hours all these clothing but it was always about you know i love the idea of making things and that is also a big part of ultimately what bleeders is is that it's another opportunity for me as a person who if I'm not building a world or creating something, I'm, I'm going crazy. So mm -hmm. this was a chance to so sort of, you know, I kind of made the joke because I love Sweeney Todd so much, but I was never had a chance to be in the show. So this was like, you know, this was my sort of the most self-serving thing I could ever do of, you know, making a Sweeney Todd metalcore EP so that I can finally play Sweeney Todd at something. This is this could go so far now. This could be like <laughs> Sweeney Todd stage shows, Black Veil Bride Sweeney Todd stage show. This could be a, a I whole... need to see that, please. <laughs> well, I think when this video comes out, uh, you're gonna see a lot of me how I would play this character. And uh, right. if the, I'll put it this way, if the video does not get pulled off of the internet within the first day because of the amount of blood and killing in this wow. video, uh, so you know what that all things go the way they should uh you'll see what i would do with this character exciting looking forward to that and i love the fact that you've taken this passion but you've also tied it in with such a worthy cause of doing a blood drive yeah where did the idea for that come from well i i gotta be honest i'd like to take all the credit but the actual truth is that this was initially brought to me by our manager blasco who as a kid who grew up in los angeles went to a show in Hollywood in the 80s that Wasp had put on where they did a blood drive at the show. Uh, and it was sort of part and parcel of Wasp in those days. You know, obviously Blackie Lawless is eating raw meat on stage and throwing blood and everything. And so it, it had, you know, a lot to do with their imagery. Um, and I don't, I'm not saying that it wasn't altruistic, but I'm not sure that the idea behind it was anything more than like a lot of things in the 80s sort of surface level stuff where it's oh blood get it um and you know he mentioned it where and i thought wow that's interesting because the way in which for me what bleeders is representing at least lyrically for me having written the lyrics to the song and thinking about it um it was about the sort of innate connectivity that everyone has regardless of the things that uh bother us and it's a song about in some degree and it's sort of odd to say but it's a song about celebrating the reality that there are people and things that you absolutely despise and there's feelings that you have of revenge that you want to get and everything else but to be able to temper that with the reality that everybody's just doing their best to get through and stay alive and and be the you know get from one day to the next and the people that you perceive as villains or whatever else have their own story going on. Um, because that's the biggest issue I have, right? Is like, you know, I, I'm, I feel really detached from a lot of my peers. I don't feel a lot of uh, understanding of modern, uh, what the modern way in which art and media is represented or the ways in which record campaigns are put together or the ways in which singers and bands market themselves. All of it feels really foreign to me. And I sometimes find myself becoming sort of curmudgeon -y about the state of things. And that in, in its own way is uh, sort of, it's a silly notion because everybody's just doing their best to, to do what they wanna do. And similarly, everybody in the world may find themselves, not saying you will, but you may find yourself in a situation where you need to lean on uh, a person you don't even know for help. And that's mm -hmm. essentially what a blood drive is. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's taking, something that you may never and very likely will never meet uh, in any possibility meet the person who you are using their blood in a situation where it may save your life and so i like how much it represents the tot totality of the human experience and how we exist in this time now where 
uh, everybody sort of obsesses over the differences that we have and the um, social and uh, political perspectives that we sit from and the mm -hmm. ways in which we speak to each other. I made the joke the other day that we socially sort of feel like everybody in the, especially in the U.S., is on cocaine at all times because cocaine is a drug of uh waiting for the other person to be done talking so that you can say the thing you want to say and that's sort of that's how so everything true. is now where yeah, like so you know everyone is just has their opinions and in a situation like a blood drive mm. you have no idea what the social or political perspective is of somebody who donated blood but it may save your life and isn't it interesting that in reality the human experience is one that's much more connected than it is separated. Mm. Do you know what? It's, you're actually sometimes not, I wouldn't say hard to interview, but my brain can't stay on track with where I'm going because <laughs> you say so many things. I'm like, that is so true. Let's talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about that. Let's talk about I have to pick up on what you've said there because, like, what you're saying basically is everyone bleeds red. And that is the thing that people are forgetting in 2024 in so many ways. But, but also, when you were talking about, um, with the blood drive and the difficulties with your enemies and things like that. I assume you were referring to social media with a lot of what you were talking about. Do you find that we live in a world now as well as a rock star, you are put on a pedestal in not just a godlike way where people come and see you, people want to hear from you, people want to do what you're doing. They, they kind of hold you to this infallible unattainable level of perfection yeah i suppose so but i that's always made me uncomfortable i mean if you go back to our early records mm -hmm. i was trying to tell people that that's that it's not a position i'm particularly comfortable with through the songs yeah. we have a song called nobody's hero where i'm literally saying like please uh i don't know what i'm doing because the problem for me was i started the band when i was 16. So, mm. and we got popular, I was a teenager. So mm. I was ostensibly the same age as our audience. And I was then being looked to as someone who could fix problems. And in reality, I didn't know who the hell I was. I was piecing together a personality of, you know, everyone around me was significantly older, um, whether that's friends or bandmates, whatever else. And so when you're that age, you're trying to keep up with everybody and you want to be cool and you're trying to, you know, and then I got magazines interviewing me and I want to say some crazy things so I get attention and it was just like sort of I was this sort of made up personality at that age but through the songs I could find a way to be entirely genuine and so I, I thought that would be my opportunity to speak and I never was able to guess that by the time I hit my 30s I would be in a position where suddenly now there would be an expectation that I would not only know everything that I need to know, but also have the right thing to say about everything. And the truth of the matter is, um, I just am not, I would love to tell you that I am some sort of philosopher king who knows everything. But the reality is, I'm mostly thinking about like fart noises and weird songs that I can sing with my wife, like that's, you know, and calling each other weird nicknames or, or asking our cat if they know that they're a baby a uh, hundred times a day. So um, that's, you know, that's mostly what I am. And, and so yeah. what I have found is the hardest part of uh, being extraordinarily, unbelievably lucky is that the, the downside, if there is one, is that there's an expectation that you are more than what you are. So I really try to take it upon myself to make sure people know, like, when I was in my early 20s, I was a drunken mess who blacked out nearly every day and made a lot of terrible decisions and was an asshole to a lot of people and did like screwed up things. And I now in my thirties have really want you to know that it's possible to be a huge fuck up and then work through that and live a life where you can kind of have a little bit of peace. And I mm -hmm. think if I don't talk about that part of it, then I'm just presenting myself as some sort of um, like lifted anointed deity, which couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. And I think you're, what you're saying there is, is really powerful because it's something we actually talk about on the podcast because we get always asked to, on the podcast, pick who should be cancelled, who shouldn't be cancelled and, and make these judgments against people. But one thing that I'm always saying is 
there has to be room for growth because mm. once you pass 30 you're a totally different person sure totally different you know i think the hardest thing for me is like and this is going to sound funny but the real truth is um i really don't enjoy being a lot around a lot of people um and i live such a a, an amazing life that I'm so excited about where it's just me and my wife and our cats and like the five friends that I maintain. Um, and it's, it's really, that's my sort of oasis. So when you're talking about larger scale issues or things that I'm meant to know a lot about or people that I'm supposed to have a perspective on, it's harder for me because I really am detached. And a lot of that has to do with mental health. The truth of the matter is my mind is a loud and anxious place. And I have found as I've gotten older that the way to counteract that is to draw stuff, make stuff, paint stuff, and hang out with my favorite person and two sweet little animals. That's the only way that I can get through. When I was 20, I didn't know that I had that option. I thought my mind is loud and scary and anxious. So I must black out and pretend to be a rock star all the time because that's the way that I'll get through it. So it's hard for me to pass judgment on other people because um, I was in the, in the early era of my career, I was just trying not to have a anxiety attack all the time. You know what I mean? So it's, mm -hmm. it's like, and then now, I'm trying not to know anything about what's happening ever, which sounds really ignorant and terrible, but it's, it's the truth for me. Like I just do so much better when I'm not, uh, connected, you know? And so I don't show you what I had for breakfast on social media. I don't tell you what I'm thinking right now. I show you what I want to show you, which is curated things that are created to entertain you because the job that I was given at 16 years old was to entertain people. And I take that job really seriously. And I don't think that the job that I was given was, how can you make the dumbest content possible to promote your song? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. and it seems like that's really where we're at. And I don't judge the artists that do it, but it seems, it's such a shame that things are created now with the lowest common denominator in mind when it comes to how people can digest it or perceive it. And I really, maybe it's an antiquated idea, but I really want to advocate for artists making stuff and showing you how much they love it in the way that they want to show it to you, as opposed to um, everybody being really scared that they're not saying the right thing. Everybody being really scared that they're not making the right TikTok video. Yeah. 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 I feel like as somebody, sorry, Sophie, I feel like as yeah. somebody who is chronically online as a job, um, it. I feel really bad for artists. I really do. And I say this all the time. I don't envy being a musician in 2024 because you have to be a musician, your own social media manager. You have to be a personality. You have to make content every day. It's like you have one job and then multiple other jobs on top of that. And I don't expect musicians to know how to make a social media video. I expect them to make music because that's what they do. And I, I can't imagine how stressful it must be for newer artists coming into the game thinking I've got to make music and then I've also got to manage my own social media presence and then I've also got to make all my graphics myself take all my photos myself and it's just so overwhelming mm, it's well you know I, I not only do I agree with you I think that um I think that that's maybe why it's going to change in some degree because I think that you're going to have a, a whole era of artists that you know Sometimes I go, does anyone notice that this sucks? Like, is, is anybody noticing that um, your favorite band uh, pretending to sing a song to a phone uh, and they clearly look uncomfortable is not the ideal way to present this? And it, by the way, if you're an artist that that's the way that you want to present it, please do it. It's not a judgment. But I know for a fact that nine times out of 10, art is represented to people now through this would be a good thing to get engagement. And the engagement conversation is surrounded around the idea of how do you get people to think that you are being genuine? And mm. the answer is just be genuine. Uh, but unfortunately, just like, and, and this is a huge other tangent, but just like in 2014, record labels were telling me that I needed a, more men in my audience 
because a male audience would be better. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Uh, just like that, I think that record labels telling artists mm -hmm. that essentially your audience is dumb and you need to make dumb content for them is the next thing that's going to change. Because, you know, we've talked a lot and I, and I mention this all the time. It, w w w the, the, one of the greatest things that's happened that I've noticed in the last couple of years is that the inherent misogyny within like metalcore when it comes to the, the way that labels and the back end people treat audiences. I'm not speaking about the way in which artists treat their audience because that's a, everybody's different and your experience at a show is different. And I can't speak in a broad generalization in that way, but I can say that I, no one says that kind of shit to me anymore. And that is a good thing. Just like I think moving forward, I, you won't see as many artists being told by their label, hey, could you make the dumbest thing of all time? And then that's how we're going to promote this. It's, do you know what, when you sometimes when you when you said earlier, and this has stuck with me because you said earlier, I'm I'm not some kind of philosopher. Now, I don't know whether it's <laughs> your way of looking at things for being neurodivergent, because Yasmin and I are both neurodivergent, too. <laughs> or whether it's um upbringing i don't know what it is but you have this really unique way of looking at things andy which is like this kind of it's like you've taken a step back where everybody else is like up close to something it's like you've taken a step back and just gone no can you not all see this bigger picture <laughs> and i i think you've done that for a very long time because yasmin and i were even talking about the fact that as a band you were this place for women for queer people for people who weren't the stereotypical rock fan uh, but what is the stereotypical rock fan that's a whole different uh, topic yeah does that ever cause you frustration like seeing that and knowing that you can see that bigger picture um i guess to some degree but i think that the problem with that is if you start to think that you have a better perspective than other people then you lose um the ability to be sort of uh subjective you know you can't if you start to be feel certain that you see things that others don't um you're pretty miserable in conversation because you're so certain of your beliefs and the way you see stuff i think the more important thing for anybody is to try to see whether the actions and the experiences and the conversations and the friendships and everything else that they have benefit them and add to their life in any way. What I did was a couple years ago, you know, relatively speaking, now that I'm in my thirties, a couple years is 15 minutes, but in the old days, a couple <laughs> years felt like a long time. Um, I'm there with you. But yeah. Uh, I, I made the distinction that, there were a lot of people in my life that weren't benefiting me that I was having to pretend to be somebody else or mm -hmm. um, change the reality of who I was and abandoning the things that I enjoyed um, because I wanted to fit in with people that I had made friends with or people that were within the industry or people, you know, singers of bands that I was friendly with. And eventually you go like, I, I don't know if, if they're wrong and I'm right, but I do know that for me, they're wrong. And I, I think that I need them to be out of my life. And the difference is the older I've gotten, the more I see that it's possible that for others, I may be that wrong person. You know, I'm sure that there are a million people that I've met over the years who were completely turned off by the idea of even talking to me. Right. Um, but there's there's plenty of people and I tried so hard as a kid to be everything that everybody needed me to be you know yeah. I was everybody talks shit about my band so I need to be uh the nicest person possible in every context and uh you know it, maybe if maybe if they see my personality then they won't be so mean about my band or maybe if I can be so nice to them then they won't talk shit online and I always tell the story I remember years ago this is like eight or nine years ago, there was one fan account. And this isn't a day where you could still see, it was like when Twitter and Instagram were sequential. So you could see stuff all the time and you'd recognize, you know, this is back in the day when I would like look at my mentions on things or read comments. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. I remember seeing this one fan account that all they did was talk shit about me all the time, but they were like a, a, a black veil fan account, right? Like they, but all they would do is I was an asshole and the clothes I would wear are bad or whatever else, all this, just me all the time, right? And I remember thinking, um, when, when I know their face, when they come to a show, if they come to a meet and greet or something, I'm going to go out of my way to be so nice to them, right? Like, so that they can see, like, I'm not mean or evil. Like, I care about this and I want you to have a good experience and I want you to feel like this show is a safe place and exciting and everything else. And I remember this one time in particular where that person came to the meet and greet. I recognized him. I clocked him right away. And I went out of my way to be like Andy times 40, just like the most gregarious person I could possibly be. And then like a fool the next day, I was like, I got to see what this person has to say now. And all they were saying was that I had, I was so fake and that I was acted so nice. And they knew that deep down I was so terrible. And I, it was then that I kind of realized like, there's some people that just aren't going to like you or have chosen to write a narrative about you that doesn't run with your narrative about yourself. And so all you can do is be the best version of yourself you can and view the world through your own prism and try to act with kindness to the people around you and limit the exposure that you have to people that you know to be uh, what you perceive to be villainous. Do you know what? We have a segment on this podcast called Words of Wisdom. Yasmin, that is now our words of wisdom for the rest of the year. That, <laughs> yeah. is, that was facts. That was facts. Straight that was facts. healthy, healthy facts. We've been talking about our therapy facts recently, and that is that is a really strong one. Andy, I'm very aware that um, our time has come to an end here, but I, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to you, to your, to everything you do in the scene, because you're, you're very much loved by a lot of the listeners of this podcast. Mm and and by us as well yeah. for... that's so kind i want to say i'm so sorry for all of the different instances of me talking over you guys or interrupting you during this interview uh I, i'm oh, sure no. when it's watched back <laughs> um i've been known to do that and i, I try to uh i try not to but i can't stop talking <laughs> so it's the way that i am and the older i get i'm like maybe i should uh mention that at some point because uh sometimes when people talk to me um they might think that i'm trying to uh to control a conversation it's really not it's just i i get excited and i have a lot of stuff to say so if i did in any way i apologize but i appreciate you guys uh allowing me to word vomit all over your show that is how we communicate. We talk yep. about neurodivergence all the time on this podcast. That is exactly how we communicate. I struggle with people who wait for cues to talk because then I have to sure, wait. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for chatting to us. We're so looking forward to everyone getting to hear the EP, getting to see. We, we can't wait to see the video. So yes, thank bring you. it and up. Thank you to you both. I appreciate you both. And, and I, I'm really excited to be on the show and uh, I can't wait to see it. So uh, thank you again. Fantastic. Thanks. Well, thank you. That's everything. Thanks, um, and yeah, I hope it all goes well with the release. God, there's so many questions I could ask you. I could go on I forever know. chatting to you. You actually have. <laughs> well, so we'll many... have to do it again. So have to do it again. So too many pearls of wisdom in there. <laughs> thank you. All right, guys. Well, I got to head to so rehearsal much. so I can yeah. learn how to sing songs I haven't sang in 12 years. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye. I'm going to wait until bye. bye.